お座りお前さっき本気だって言っただろ本気真面目にやるから教えてくれって言っただろ言った試験の日まで俺が本気で教えるだからお前も本気で頑張れせっかく作った同好会だろダンダンいい you give me gum gum. ではどうやら You do dum dum, you give me gum gum. 黒煙竜が闇の力を得て変化したものなぜなら私は天使だからジャオシンハッドッジョー Your name dum dum ジョーと暗煙竜は黒煙竜が闇の力を得て変化したものではどうやら呼ばれたみたい A common complaint I hear about Love, Shunibio, and other delusions is that Rika never changes. This was especially frustrating for those who watched the Love, Shunibio film, Take On Me, a movie that addressed Rika's Shunibio behavior, the delusion part of the title, and the potential negatives of allowing it to persist any further. Yet, the film ended with seemingly no significant change. As Toka brings up at the beginning of the film, if Rika's Shunibio was brought on by the death of her father, and Rika has now made peace with his death, then for what reason does she have to hold on to it? Is she acting this way to goof off and ignore responsibility? Does she not take her relationship seriously? In the end, Toka and many viewers concluded that Rika is just a girl thinking only of herself. The movie even ends with an acknowledgement by Yuta that the reason he loves Rika is because she is a Chunibyo. But what is Yuta saying here? That he loves having a girlfriend who can't tell reality from fiction? Or that he enjoys that she is immature? Nothing's changed. At the end of the day, she's still wearing that eye patch. But that's where I disagree, because I think this confusion about Rika growing out of her syndrome comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of what Rika's Chunibyo actually is, by both the characters in the universe and the audience, and is an extension of what is sadly an even more common take I see, one that even fans of the series make, even if they don't say it this way or mean it as a negative, that the reason Rika acts the way she does is because she's stupid. A stupid, dumb, baby stupid brain. It's true that Rika is a goofball, and so it's easy for her over-enthusiasm to come back to bite her, especially in a comedy series. So in that way, yes, Rika is a bit of a dum-dum. But I don't think that's what people mean when they say she's stupid, as any character trait has its ups and downs. No, it seems that many genuinely seem to think that Rika is completely oblivious to the world around her, and has a total lack of self-awareness. And it's these two through lines, a misunderstanding of her chunibio and her emotional intelligence, that clouds the discussion surrounding this character, when it really shouldn't. After all, how the series initially endeared us to Rika's silly fantasies was by recontextualizing all we had seen before by giving it emotional weight. While people tend to focus on the most obvious application of Rika's Shunibio, the coping aspect, I don't think the implications are fully understood by many, as well as there being an entirely separate side of it that I feel goes unmentioned by the community. That Rika's Chunibio allows her to express herself in a way that is even more true to who she is than if she were just being normal. It is not some mask she is wearing. Rika is Rika because of her Chunibio, and it's this emotional core that sticks around even after she copes with the death of her father, all serving as layers that only enhance the charm of our lovable, goofy, eyepatch sporting, umbrella wielding, not so magical, magical girl, Rika Takanashi. begin, I feel it's necessary to acknowledge two things. One, while I'm going to be really positive about the romance between Rika and Yuta, I might as well address the elephant in the room that is the slapstick. At the end of the day, Love Chunibyo bills itself more often than not as a comedy first, and it's pretty clear from episode one the extremes it's willing to go to. If Kaon is real life but cuter, then Love Chunibyo is the real world but crazier. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. Every now and then Rika gets hit for seemingly no reason, or gets hit way too hard for basically nothing. Other times, Yuta doesn't hit her hard enough, and it becomes a bit awkward to take these more subdued moments as jokes. Though, those are few and far between. Generally, though, it works as an over-the-top response to Rika's over-the-top antics and is inoffensive. But then there are other times, like in season one or the movie, where it just nails it. It's like, BAM! Instant bobblehead! So, as far as the Rika abuse goes, it's pretty hit or miss. And the fact I made that pun should tell you how seriously I take it. 
It doesn't seem to be canon, in the sense that other characters don't treat it seriously or like it's a big deal. It doesn't occur during the scenes we're supposed to take seriously, Nibutani and Toka are just as over the top, and Yuta's pretty equal opportunity about the whole thing. So it doesn't really bother me or ruin my suspension of disbelief for them as a couple, and I think should be judged with the awareness of the genre it occurs in. Second, there will be some sections dedicated to re-establishing key facts about Riga's character, specifically with Season 1. However, this will not be needless recapping for an audience that I'm assuming has already seen the show, as instead I'll be focused less on what happens and more about what these key moments mean for the psychology of Rika. I think it's easy for someone to know the message of Love Chunibio's first season, to know what Chunibio is, to know the reasons Rika acts the way she does, but to still not get it, with no disrespect to the audience. The implications of what each revelation means for Rika's character can easily go missed on a first viewing, because we aren't even given the full picture until the second half of the finale, and even then, that information is quickly overshadowed by an emotional climax. Season 1 does not guide his viewers towards an ending that requires much thinking outside of what is presented to feel satisfied, but that extra layer of depth is practically required to understand Rika going forward into Season 2 and the movie, which is why I feel the need to bring this information back up to create a new baseline for understanding Rika, which of course is impossible to truly understand unless you really know also known as 8th grade syndrome, a common occurrence of adolescents where one starts to believe they are special in some way. One may believe they are smarter than others, another cooler than most, or possess powers you couldn't possibly comprehend. Or to put it simply, it's self-expression, and all the usual embarrassing ways a child or young teenager may choose to do so. While ex Chunibio like Yuta and Nibutani look back at their edgier days with disgust, it is because what they found so magical was themselves. Of course, when given a hint of perspective, this self-aggrandizement feels incredibly embarrassing to them. Rika can initially come off this way, using Chunibyo in a way that makes her look cool, as she says. But as the story unfolds, we find out that her Chunibyo, her self-expression, is quite different. It didn't come from finding something special in herself, because who she was inside was someone she longed to be rid of. A depressed and broken little girl who had lost her father, and who could no longer look at the world in any other way that wasn't gray. And thus, we come to our first application of Rika's Chunibyo. The death of Rika's father was an event that happened so suddenly that she couldn't even feel its impact. Her heart just hadn't caught up to the moment, but the adults around her made it clear that the time for healing had already passed on without her. It was time to face reality. Her dad was dead, and she must now say goodbye forever. Even after the funeral, it still didn't feel real. But what did appear to her that night. One perfectly timed, coincidental little moment, when Rika saw an array of lights shining off ships in the distance, making Rika feel seen by her father, and like she could see him. The priest had claimed that the funeral was the last moment Rika would have a chance to meet with her father on a personal level, the last time they could meet, and that the only way to do so was by reaching out and touching her father's grave. A grave that to Rika was merely a picture and a chunk of stone. Rika could not see those cold and feeling objects as her father, but the beautiful lights that shone upon her in her time of need? That was like Papa. It's important to note that Rika was not a Chunibyo when this event happened. Some less observant viewers like to paint Rika as if she is completely detached from reality, that she truly believes her father exists in a magical land that she can one day get to. But even back then, Rika knew that those lights were just ships, even though what she felt and saw was much greater. She just needed a way for it to make sense, even if for now she had none. That was until she saw Yuta. A dorky boy walking around in his dark, edgy outfit, shouting passionate chants about dark flames while rocking his super cool bangs. This kid was hiding behind bushes and carrying a freaking gun. Understandably, she was in awe. Rika thought the way Yuta saw the world was much cooler, so much more fun and freeing than bottling up her feelings and playing the good girl, all for a family who couldn't figure out how to help her feel whole again. And from that moment on, she sought to imitate him, to be able to look at the world in a way that could feel real to her, instead of being confused and overwhelmed, with no one she could turn to for help. To finally have a way to translate the emotion she experienced on that beach. Thanks to Yuta, Rika was gifted words to describe the world she had felt, and eyes that could see it. The invisible boundary lines. 
あたを見つけるために育成層の時を経てここに来たなんか告ってるぞ羨ましいいやそういうんじゃないだろうこれそうこれは中中中二病だ It can be very easy early on in Love Chinibio's run to hear words like Dark Flame Master or Wicked Lord Shingen of the Tyrant's Eye and be overwhelmed by all the new lingo and just ignore it as goofy randomness. I know I sure did. I took everything Rika said as if it was just nonsense, and it was fun to see Yuta call her out and bounce off of her. But with the full context of her backstory, almost all of Rika's words and actions, in season 1, have an underlying meaning to them, one that is usually Rika reaching out for someone to understand her, specifically Yuta. This is why she appears on his balcony and asks if he wants to see her eye. It's a gesture that to her is a way of asking to be friends, since she believes Yuta is still in Tuchunibio and would understand her. Though, before he can answer, she disappears, presumably from being too nervous. Later, she stages having to go to the nurse's office due to her mega! Reacting to Yuta. All she's really doing is asking him for help so she can get some alone time. If this were a normal romance or Rika was a normal girl, then she probably would have set this up as her losing her contacts or hurting her eye and needing assistance getting to the nurse's office. When Rika talks about the eye drops being poisonous, she's not just saying random stuff. This is her way of playing off, her eye not actually hurting, but in a Chunibio way. She couldn't possibly use this stuff on her wicked Lord Shingen, its dark powers would be drained by the poison! When Ishiki says it looks like Rika is confessing to Yuta, he really isn't wrong. She is using Chunibio in a way to be confident enough to reach out to her hero. Even frivolous gestures like commanding train doors to open or summoning a magical code for a vending machine drink is just Rika's way of trying to impress Yuta by showing how cool she is. And it's these sillier actions that mostly fill the first half of Love Chunibio, that without context give off the feeling that Rika is just a silly girl saying silly things, when that's not the case. Rika even name drops the invisible boundary lines after their first day of school, and how she specifically wants to find them with Yuta. The stated goal of Rika's club is to find the invisible boundary lines, or to find a group of friends who can understand and help Rika through her problems. This is why she tells the teacher that Chimera is important, because that's her cat who she loves and who she feels supports her. Which by the end of the season, they all do help her find closure, as they each come to understand her to varying degrees, and all the goofy antics leading up to this moment were to strengthen that bond. Rika's goals and intentions are consistent from the start. All this is to say that Rika isn't running away from her father's death. She She just wants to come to terms with it in her own way, but with the person who gave her that hope in the first place. She wants someone who sees the world the way she does to help her find closure. And it's because Rika was right about who Yuta is, that he is someone who can resonate with her way of seeing things, that he comes to not only understand Rika, but to deeply care for her. Leading to the moment that Yuta finally bridges that gap that Rika had longed for ever since she met him all those years ago. <laughs> I think that Yuta is talking about losing that sense of wonder for the world, looking at the sky as mundane and not considering how amazing it is. The lights Rika saw may have not actually been magical, but they felt magical. They felt like her father. And that feeling is real. Yuta engages with that fantasy and proudly shows Rika the invisible boundary lines, those ships, and tells her that the lights are watching her, and that it's okay to tell them how she truly feels. And it's because someone acknowledged Rika's feelings and took them seriously, because someone didn't berate her for the way she understood the world, that she now has the confidence to express her emotions freely and finally say goodbye to Papa. This is the heart of Love Chinibio and Other Delusions first season, a message that resonates so strongly because of the kindness and patience it affords its audience, to find Find people who can truly understand and help us sort out the unique way we each perceive the world. There are no invisible boundary lines. They are just beautiful lights like that amazing sunset. But in truth, are there even amazing sunsets? To describe them as such is to reach beyond ourselves and give meaning to something that inherently has none. There are just normal lights on normal ships in the normal sky. But Love Chinibio says that even if we are attributing value or description based on our own point of view or how we feel, that doesn't make how we see it any less real, and in fact is the only thing that does. When Yuta says that magic isn't real, and that Chunibio is foolish, Rika only disagrees once Yuta claims that it has no power. 
because she's seen the effect of Shinibio's power, of Yuta's power, in her own life. And just as well, we see the many other ways it's used all over the series. Rika used Chunibio not only as a way to understand the world, but also as a way to express herself. Chunibio allows her to show how inquisitive and excitable she is, finding joy in the tiniest of things. The way she talks, the way she dresses, or the excitement she feels from opening a donut package. All thanks to a stupid young man who thought he was a part-time ninja and a full-time wizard. The emotions or thoughts that many of us keep quiet out of fear of rejection or being misunderstood, Rika verbalizes, allowing her to truly be free in her thoughts. Even if to everyone else she seems unintelligible, better to be misunderstood than silent. Because speaking out the way she does has allowed her to find the human connection she otherwise wouldn't had she had kept her weirdness to herself. The people who do get it, like Deko Mori or Yuta, will reach out to her, and those are the people Rika wants to meet in the first place. Rather than find the perfect words that everyone will get, she finds the words that make sense to her and a select group of people. And it's those very same people who were able to help her in her time of need. Heck, besides her family, even the people who don't understand her find her charming. Being a Chunibio has never really hindered her life, because normal people are smart enough to know that while she's not being serious, she's being sincere. Rika is genuinely excited about what she loves and the things she does. What does it matter what it's called? And that's what attracts both the characters and the audience to her. When some critics say they want Rika to stop acting like a fool and just be normal, all that would look like is instead of Rika saying something silly, she would say nothing. Instead of her being outgoing, she would be quiet. And instead of rebelling and trying to figure things out for herself, she would be submissive and put on a fake smile. That's Rika without Chunibio. Because at heart, Rika is a very shy girl who has found not only a worldview that she understands, but also one that is just enjoyable and freeing. Chunibio is cool, she says on multiple occasions, because, yeah, viewing the world in the way she does is fun. Going on adventures with Dekamori, commanding windmills to turn, or sealing a volcano and carving your name into the side of a mountain is fun. I can relate to Rika's form of expression in a lot of ways. I end conversations with a big ol' thumbs up. If I need to move past someone, I try to do it in a way that keeps up the flow I already had. It makes me feel cool. And yes, I am the resident master waterbender at every pool party I've ever been to. Everyone has a way of expression or understanding the world, and we all have little things that make us interesting. So long as it doesn't harm our lives or the lives of others, then it can only add to our own personal charm. Love Chinebio's confession scene is most remembered for its adorable exchange between our two romantically awkward protagonists. It's sweet, intimate, and provides a good amount of comedy by having the usually chuny adverse straight man Yuta use Chinebio as a way to give himself the confidence to confess his feelings to Rika. But that's not why I love the scene. I love it because of the beautiful underlying motive that pushes Rika to confess her feelings first. A quiet couple of seconds where Rika is able to gaze upon what are otherwise just cars passing by in the distance, and with wonder in her eyes say with sincerity that the light is dancing. While it may not seem like it on first viewing, her confession, a simple I like you, was just as much a result of Rika engaging in her Chunibio as Yuta going into Dark Flame Master Mode to initiate her lover's pack. Here's what I mean. Despite all the theatrics and bravado, Rika is an incredibly shy person when it comes to expressing sincere emotions without a silly pretense. Everything Rika does must be filtered through her Chunibio lens, because she had been conditioned to believe that reality by its nature is bleak and wonderless. But in this moment, where Rika is feeling so unsure of herself, Wrapped with a sense of fear, nervousness, and worry, and even though she is still grieving over the death of her father, Rika retains her ability to see the world in a way that is beautiful, immediately registering the lights from cars as something magical and mesmerizing. That's why the scene under the bridge hits me so hard, because Rika is being reminded of the power that Yuta has bestowed upon her. To see those lights is beautiful, and to see them that way naturally, without even having to think about it. And standing right behind her is the young man who gave her that gift. To be able to gaze upon what are otherwise just cars passing by in the distance, and with wonder in her eyes say with sincerity that the light is dancing. At that point, one amount of nervousness or embarrassment could hold her back. Yes, come on, let's do it! Let's do it! Just do it, come on, yes! No, on the lips! On the lips! 
No, don't make it end like this. Let's do it. On the. Oh, oh. Yes, come on. Let's do it. Do it. Come on, kiss the kisser. Come on, do it. Let's stop waiting. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. Ah, come on. Fuck. Fuck. What the fuck? An underappreciated aspect of crafting a good ending is how it acts as a promise to the viewer. After the screen goes black, you don't know what will happen next to your favorite characters, but how they exit leaves a lasting impression on the audience that they will remember them by. In real life, there are no perpetual happy endings where all problems cease, and to be fair, most of us understand that our characters should continue on their journeys and face challenges. But in fiction, the moment the author puts down the pen, it can be assumed that whatever direction the character exits in becomes the new status quo. Or at the very least, it feels that way. Take the Toy Story franchise as an example. By the end of the third film, we were led to believe that Woody and the gang would spend their lives with Bonnie. Realistically, we know that can't last forever. We know eventually the toys will go to yet another owner, or maybe they'll get left in the attic. But we don't see that. And so the ending can still leave us emotionally satisfied that as far as we know, the last moments we saw the toys, they were happy. But then we have Toy Story 4, a movie that disrupts the idealistic happy ending and injects more conflict that many of us feel we now have to attach to the emotional ending of the first. Without spoiling anything, the new status quo, the new promise, at the end of 4 is one that left fans way more mixed. Even even if this outcome was somehow inevitable, it wouldn't feel that way if we had stopped at Toy Story 3. So when I had completed Love Chinibio and Other Delusion Season 1, my assumption was that based on how it ended, Rika would find a nice balance between her Chinibio as a form of self-expression, and also engage more with her serious side that we had seen at the end of the season. I also thought that Yuta would be much more open about his Chinibio, perhaps he would instigate some of the antics himself, he'd lighten up and not be so serious, and would be very open to his feelings about Rika. But because Season 2 exists, I now know that isn't the case. Rika is even more entrenched in her Chinibio antics than before. Yuta calls out Rika for her Chinibio more than he engages with it, and most disappointing for me and a lot of other viewers, his relationship with Rika feels like it's even less intimate for most of the season than it was at the end of the first. If season one left me feeling like Rika and Yuta were moving forward in their relationship, season two ends in a way that is almost dismissive of that idea. <laughs> <gasps> Thankfully, this feeling of finality and a promise is very well conveyed in Take On Me, particularly in its handling of Rika's development. Painting an optimistic future for both her love life and a promise that Rika would eventually grow out of many of her Chinibio ways, all for the sake of a relationship that she most desires. At least, that's how I felt. Turns out, there weren't many reviews I could find that understood the growth of Rika in the way I had interpreted her. Many, in fact, claim she didn't change at all or dismissed her development, a sentiment that I think is completely unfounded. Something I noticed with Take On Me was that Rika has quite a few moments that show how capable and mature she's become, like how she manages to find her mom all on her own in a city she's never been to, how she made sure to think about her expenses by bringing extra cash, and especially with how much time and thought she has given to her identity and her relationship with Yuta. More on that later. There are even small things, like when told that the castle hotel isn't a real castle, she doesn't try to justify it in a Chunibia way. She just says, I know that, and goes on to have a real conversation. And there are quite a few moments like that where Rika shows how self-aware she is throughout the film, much like in season one. One of my favorites is her telling the story about a teacher trying to console her on a school trip, something I don't think she'd normally talk about before, and also has no magical element to it. She even calls her that damn teacher, which was hilarious because of how out of character it felt to hear Rika be so blunt about it. As far as the romantic future for the couple is concerned, the movie is practically punching you in the face saying, THEY'RE GOING TO GET MARRIED! Let's count the ways. Yuta and Rika traveling together is framed as eloping by all of the characters. Yuta imagines a future where he is married to Rika and has a kid. The two attempt to stay at a love hotel, and when that fails, they pretend to be siblings to get a room at a different hotel, with Rika having to play the role of his little sister and being noticeably more annoyed than embarrassed about it, as if she hates the idea of Yuta being anything but her boyfriend. This is contrasted immediately afterwards by Yuta saying he doesn't see Rika as a sister figure, and the particular focus on Yuta riding Rika's 
Rika's name down with his last name. Yuta buys Rika a ring as a promise to always be with her and that he will buy her a proper ring when he has enough money. They're gonna get married! He's even coming all this way to get permission from Rika's mother to marry her. I mean, be with her forever. And finally, the movie ends with Rika and Yuta going to a wedding, with the last shot of the movie being Rika grabbing the wedding bouquet. Which, if you don't know, the superstition is that whoever catches it will be the next person to get married. And Rika jumped headlong into that. Do you get it? This is why I can't take seriously this idea that Yuta and Rika's romance doesn't change or that Rika doesn't grow. While season 2 flirted with the ideas of romantic progression, each moment had to be bound up in the idea that it's okay to take one's time with these things. You don't have to hold hands on the first date or kiss after a month. It's okay to go at your own pace. And while that's a great message, the amount of time spent committed to this one idea, along with an ending so passive about that growth, left us with a dynamic that was almost too easygoing. It's fine to take your time in real life, but even then there's a limit to how long you can stay stagnant. And even less time when it's a show the audience is expected to be invested in. Take On Me doesn't have this problem. The character's romantic relationship is the foundation of the entire film, and both parties are making claims and promises that they are actively trying to reach together. At the beginning of the film, Toga questioned if Rika was truly serious about her romance with Yuta, or if she was just living selfishly. So when Toka says at the end of the film, this is the key to your new home, and throws the bouquet containing the key to her new apartment above Yuta's, she tosses it out as far as she can, and Rika rushes without hesitation to grab it, despite the giant pool that she would have to land in. I think, proving to Toka that she is truly committed to this relationship, visually conveying just how far Rika will go to forever be with Yuta. Oh, and uh, one final note to add to the they will get married pile. In the post credit scene, Rika shows up and asks Yuta if she would like to see her eye, a gesture that throughout the show was a signifier of their relationship becoming... deeper. More, um... Intimate, if you will. That's all I'm saying. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but honestly, none of that compares to the most ridiculous claim stated in the opening of this video. The idea that Rika does not develop or change, that she's more caught up in remaining as a childish girl who wants to ignore reality. So, to put it bluntly, Rika isn't stupid. Based on everything I've talked about up to this point should be abundantly clear. She doesn't actually believe in Dark Lords or Magic Packs, it's simply a fun way that she connects to Yuta ever since the end of Season 1. And while Yuta can get annoyed when he thinks Rika isn't taking something seriously, he generally does find her personality endearing. There's a small moment in the film where this happens. Yeah, Bethany. This sticks out to me because while at first Yuta is annoyed and confused, the moment Rika asks if what she is doing is weird, aka bad, Yuta quickly says it's no big deal. Yuta doesn't get annoyed when Rika acts like herself, he gets annoyed when he thinks she isn't taking something important seriously. But the moment she was worried and almost made to feel bad, he understood and made sure to back off and tell her it was no big deal. She was just being her playful self. Because just like back in season 1 when Yuta pretended he was fine with Rika acting normal, inside he longed for her to be free to act once again as the girl he fell in love with. Which is why even though him returning in the finale was so important in the moment, for giving Rika the chance to heal and express herself, it had the potential to be damaging long term. When Yuta returns to Rika, he doesn't just say he wants to help her with her dad, he also says this. <laughs> Showing that he wants Rika to be herself, to be Chunibyo. But since Rika has spent most of her life as Wicked Lord Shingen, she doesn't feel as if she has an identity past that, and that the identity she does have is the only reason that Yuta loves her. Or at least she fears that will be the case. In a way, Rika is terrified of becoming a normal person. She acts like everything is whimsical and grand, but her romance with Yuta is becoming more and more normal, and she's fine with that. As she grows closer to him, she starts to not really care about her persona, and would rather just love Yuta and ditch the pretenses. This is first teased in Season 2 when she talks about how she wants to take off her eye patch because as she says, it's become tedious to keep up the act. At the time, she resolved to see both her Chunibyo and her budding romance with Yuta as equally valuable, as both are extensions of him. But clearly, Rika is no longer content with this arrangement, and wishes for it to become something Something that goes far beyond a simple pact, or even needing to filter their romance through this Chunibyo lens. In the film, this conflict is represented in a scene that is essentially Yuta proposing to Rika, signified by a ring that he says will serve as a promise of the future life they will spend together, his promise to always be with her. When Rika gets the ring, she immediately jumps into Chunibyo mode out of fear, 
This response was common in season 1 and 2 when Rika would get overwhelmed by romance, and it's the same here. She says that she must put on the ring herself instead of Yuta because Wicked Lord Shingen demands it. She uses Chunibyo to make it feel less normal, and in some ways, less real. But the way she reacts and talks about the ring going forward shows her true feelings rather clearly. Rika talks about how she really loves the ring, but it feels like it's draining her power. Then to ease her mind, Yuta says it's a power-boosting item for the Wicked Lord Shingen, a Chunibyo response. However, Rika says it back in the form of a nervous question, showing that she'd much rather have it just be for her. The same reasoning continues into the next scene, where Rika looks at herself in the mirror without the eye patch or yellow eye, and doesn't seem to dislike it. Regardless of if Rika normally takes off her eye patch before bed, which we know a long time ago she didn't, the film is clearly showing this dilemma visually by focusing on scenes where Rika does not have her Chinebio garb, and immediately after this she tries to kill kill Yuta. <laughs> and immediately after this, she tries to kiss Yuta while looking this way. In season 2, she felt pressured to kiss Yuta, but now this response to seeing him feels natural and desirable, whereas before, the embarrassment and fear brought her to tears. Finally, I think it's rather interesting that we don't see Rika's yellow eye, her wicked Lord Shingen, in the entire film. Even in her big battle with Dekamori, she doesn't take it off. While it could very easily be a mistake, I think regardless, it's an interesting little indicator for Rika's changing perspective. Which leads us to my favorite scene in the entire series, where Rika tries to get rid of her Chunibyo, physically representing her change by trying to abandon her eye patch. The visuals here are simple but effective, as Rika describes the possibilities of what Yuta may think of her if she gives up her Chunibyo. Stars, hearts, and wispy lines representing the things that make Rika unique shoot out of her design, as she becomes simpler and simpler, until she is left as nothing more than a formless mass that fades into nothingness. もう闇の力なんかにこだわる必要はないはずだ。ですよね。ただ、リッカのチュニビオは、いや、ジャオシンガンは、リッカにとって俺とのつながりというか、絆みたいなものなんじゃないかって。I have seen way too many people dismiss Rika's internal conflict as if it is based on her desire to stay Chinibyo in the superficial sense. Presenting Rika's conflict as though it were as silly as, do I be with Yuta, or do I keep my socially awkward cosplay fetish? When, in actuality, it's, do I get to love Yuta more and risk losing him, or do I love Yuta as I am and suppress myself from a deeper, but unknown bond? This obviously isn't to say that Rika has totally matured. After all, she definitely shouldn't have left without telling Yuta where she was going and left behind the ring. That's gonna send some mixed signals, but the motive is clear in how Rika came to this decision, if only to us. It's not like this was a choice on whether to stay with Yuta or not, it was a decision as to who she would return to Yuta as. And this is definitely the most introspective Rika has ever been about her relationship, and the clearest example of how much thought she has put into her specific role in that dynamic. Rika is terrified of changing because she has no clue who she will become. Who is Rika if she is not Wicked Lord Shingen? While Toka claimed that Rika's Chunibyo was selfish and that she doesn't care about anyone else but herself, we see that her acting the way she does is directly because she cares so much about Yuta. She wants him to continue loving her, so she has remained the same for as long as she could. But that isn't satisfying or plausible to her anymore. And even if she didn't have a desire to change, she can feel it happening every time she is around Yuta. And just like Sophia before her, she begins to look beyond herself at something she wants once more. In a crazy way, abandoning her Chunibyo is the selfish option to Rika. We know that Yuta does not care if she changes, and in fact loves her the way she currently is. That aforementioned daydream Yuta had of being married to Rika ends with him thinking that even if Rika were to stay as a Chunibyo, that it wouldn't be so bad at all. In fact, he believes it would be pretty cool. So, is it worth it to allow yourself to change if who you become could potentially alienate the person you claim to love? What if Rika is no longer the same girl that Yuta fell for? This is also what the conversation with her mom was about, where she says that being with Yuta drains her powers, her persona. But Yuta is the one who gave her that persona in the first place. It's like she's saying, why am I no longer content with what I've been given? And why does wanting more of him mean I have to give up what he already gave me? But that's the point. She wants more of Yuta and for their relationship to grow. And since that is her ultimate desire, it's inevitable that she will grow past whatever aspects of herself she doesn't want. Like her relationship with Yuta being bound to this persona, because loving Yuta is already doing that to her. She just had to face him and get confirmation that he doesn't just love her as Wicked Lord Shingen. This represents the entire problem Rika faces if she loses her Chunibyo, not realizing that she is not an empty person playing Chunibyo. Rather, her Chunibyo is the fullest expression of herself. Her creativity, her style, her wonder at the world, her love, are all extensions of the true Rika, 
regardless of what labels these things have now or later, or what over-the-top version they take. Whatever a changed Rika will look like will still be Rika, just like how Yuta was once the Dark Flame Master, but has grown into something different. This same maturity of character is inevitable for those who want to grow, and Rika will do the same, because even though Rika initially fell for Yuta as the Dark Flame Master, the Yuta she is with now is no longer fully enveloped in his persona, and yet she still loves him, because Yuta is still Yuta, and Rika will still be Rika. In the final scene, Rika asks Yuta, if I lose these powers, this persona, if I give them up, can I still be with you? She wants to know if he will still love her if she changes. She doesn't ask if he will love her if she stays the same, because she doesn't want to stay the same. To which Yuta tells her that yes, she is going to change one day and become a different person, but that regardless of who she becomes, he will still love her, and she promises the same to him. Rika will grow out of aspects of her Chunibyo as she grows closer to Yuta, but does this mean she will forsake all of her Chunibyo? I don't think so, as that's still something she and Yuta can do for fun. My impression is that Season 2's logic of we have a relationship that transcends lovers or friends is no longer needed. It was just there to help Rika process love anyway, and now that she is confident in what she wants and in facing the unknowns of getting there, I think she will move in that direction. I think the boat scene encapsulates what their future would look like very well. Rika this time allows Yuta to put the ring on her, basically a proper I do to his previous marriage proposal. Whereas before she avoided letting Yuta put on the ring for fear of how serious it was, this time she accepts it happily, a more normal thing. Then when Yuta kisses her, she doesn't recoil with Chunibyo antics like she would so often do before. She simply gets flustered and then says she wants more. And when that's still embarrassing, she says she likes it. And then they kiss again for a third time just for fun. Rika isn't running away from her future by hiding behind Chinibio anymore. And we see what I believe is a healthy use of Chinibio. To break the awkwardness, Yuta is the one to start shouting Dark Flame Master stuff as the two dorks cast off their embarrassment together and kill it with fire. If they were a normal couple, they would probably just stand there awkwardly, potentially ruining the mood. But instead, they do this to allow them to kill the tension and continue into an embrace. And I think it's telling that when they do this, the camera flips around like 10 times and is given way more fan service than the actual kiss. Because while they still intend to advance their relationship, kissing is a drug after all, at the end of the day, they're still just a couple of dorks who really love each other. And it's for all the reasons I have mentioned in this video that I thoroughly reject the notion that Rika does not grow. I think people wanted that moment, a big scene that would signify a dramatic shift in Rika and put her story to a close, a visual in the film to prove that she had changed. They wanted her to take off that eye patch, and were confused as to why even after all this supposed promise of growth, she still looked the same. Not to mention that the ending of season 2 played with the audience's expectations a little too much, and left so many unsatisfied of how little progress our main couple made having three years to stew on this dissatisfaction. Of course you're gonna be disappointed that there wasn't more when it was yanked from you the first time, but Take On Me, just like the first season, is promising a direction for the character to go in rather than a final state. And it's okay for Rika to take her time and not force what she wants to change about herself. What's important is that she wants to change, and shows throughout the film just how much calmer and mature she has become internally and externally. After all, Rika comes off as the most confident she's ever been in the final scene, and proudly flaunts her ring, a symbol of her next step into what she she wants to become. I highly doubt that when Rika says she will transform into her final form, that she means she'll act even more delusional. And since we know that Rika's Chunibyo is not just acting crazy or saying whimsical phrases, but is Rika's way of expressing herself, then we know that when Yuta says he loves Rika because she is a Chunibyo, that he's saying he loves Rika because she is herself. Which also acts as a promise that no matter who she becomes in the future, she will still have the same spirit of wonder and joy that she's always had. I would say that Chunibyo in the context of Rika is about having a more fun way of looking at life, and that's what Yuta loves about her. And it's for these reasons that I say at the beginning of this video that misunderstanding what Rika's Chunibyo is causes viewers to want her to completely change, and wanting to see her become normal is missing the point. Because she would not be abandoning her Chunibyo as some silly persona, she would be abandoning who she is. What can be abandoned would be the grand phrases she uses, like Wicked Lord Shingen or a Lover's Pact. Rika won't need to act out in a silly way to cope with loss, or to deal with new and uncomfortable experiences. And most importantly, Rika can abandon the idea that she must forever remain the same to be truly loved. It's those aspects of her Chunibyo that Rika will grow out of. Or rather, those aspects of her Chunibyo, said truthfully, are just aspects of Rika. Love Chinibio and Other Delusions has always been a gentle series that puts faith into Rika and by extension its audience. It believes that personal growth is only a matter of time. You will get there. All the movie needed to do was provide the promise that Rika was not only ready to take that first step, but wants to, and has. 
Although, no matter how much of Rika's Chunibio that she decides to abandon, I know that she and Yuta will always have a bit of magical power left in them. A power to live life in a way that is special to only them. In a world where they are together and can transform any dark and murky skyline into a sea of dancing lights. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, this video nearly drove me insane, and the only reason it is out is thanks to two very special people. As always, we give a special shout out to Kor, the editor of this video. If you were able to sit through however long this video ended up being, it was probably because it was visually interesting. So give a hand to him and go check out his channel. He does anime videos just like me, has a lot more of them, and posts way more frequently. So go check him out. And the second important shout out goes to an Annie tuber known as Antoine. He basically acted as a soundboard that I bounced all my ideas off of, and he's pretty much integral to me being able to keep my sanity while making this video. The reason I contacted him though was because he had already made a Love Chinibio video called Love Chinibio and Other Delusions Sophia's Choice. It's a great short little video that goes into a character that I didn't have any need to get into, and is basically a good defense for season two since I kind of threw it under the bus in this video. So if you want more positive stuff, about that season, then go check out his video. 